We completely believe that everyone has the capacity to be innovative, a proactive problem solver, and that's really what we teach in our innovation courses is the systematic approach to innovation. Renee Kelly, Assistant Vice President for Innovation and Economic Development at UMaine, who believes, as many of us are now realizing, that there is an innovator, or at least a creative problem solver, in all of us. I'm Ron Lisnett, and this is the Main Question Podcast. So what does it take to come up with a creative idea, a new product, something that no one has ever thought of before, which meets a need or fills a void? In a word, innovation is the skill needed to make all of that happen. The Foster Center for Innovation at the University of Maine has helped hundreds of students, faculty members, and even the public take their creative vision and turn it into a going concern, a startup company, many of which have grown into bona fide viable businesses. Named for Bion and Doreen Foster, UMaine class of 68, who were innovators themselves in real estate and other businesses, the center has also taught many thousands of students how to become creative problem solvers through the innovation engineering curriculum. The main economy is built on the backs of small business, which make up 95% of the companies in Maine. Matching smart, driven students who have a good idea with the research and development capacity at an R1 research institution like UMaine has spurred the growth of high-tech and low-tech startups and made the Foster Center one of the leading new business incubators in the state. We'll talk about the environment for entrepreneurs and startups with Renee Kelly. We'll also talk with a current and former UMaine student who each have started a company that is on the rise. Our question for this episode of the Main Question Podcast, can you teach someone to be innovative? We start with introducing our guests. My name is Renee Kelly. I'm Assistant Vice President for Innovation and Economic Development at the University of Maine. Hi, I'm uh, Ty DeLarge, CEO and founder of Real Time Reality. And about to be a graduated UMaine student in computer science and business. I'm Amber Boudiette, and I'm a co-founder and chief product officer at Martin Skincare. Well, thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. Exciting times, certainly for you, Ty, and uh, for everybody this time of year if you work on a, on a university campus. So, um, you know, we're talking about innovation and startups and entrepreneurship. Renee, maybe you can start and um, paint the picture for us. Give us the landscape in terms of the startup and small business sort of situation in Maine right now. What's the culture like? How big a part of the economy are we talking about? It's quite a large part of the economy in Maine, and, and it's growing. I mean, Maine has, for a very long time, been a small business state. Um, about 95 or, or so percent of the businesses in Maine have fewer than 500 employees, which is the federal government's definition of a small business. But what we're seeing now is um, the growth over the last 15 to 20 years of more innovation-driven uh, businesses, small businesses that are startups trying to take something new to the world. So not just to sell to the other people in the, their community, but to you know, try to sell outside of Maine or around the world because what they've developed is, is so unique that people want it from all over. We'll get to your guys' businesses here in a minute. I'm excited to hear what the ideas that you guys have. But what is it about Maine, the landscape, the people, the Yankee ingenuity, the geography? Why is it that it lends itself to small business like this? Maine has a very independent nature or culture. You know, people try to get by doing their own things. So I think that has um, encouraged a lot of the, you know, the small business activity that we see in the state because people are like, I like to do something for myself and I'm going to be my own boss. And that's great. Um, we're also very creative. You, we do have that Yankee ingenuity thread running um, throughout our culture. It's also been a hindrance over the last several years as innovation requires new solutions to problems. People need to be able to collaborate. And if, if you are only, only have that independent streak and, and don't want to work with others, it makes it really hard. So part of what we've been doing at the Foster Center is to just build that culture of collaboration and, and high aspirations to grow something beyond your local community and, and try to create ways for people to deliberately connect so that they can work together and, and grow business ideas. There's no shame in asking for help. Right, exactly. <laughs> 
Amber, let's start with you. Maybe you can tell us when you graduated from UMaine, and then what it, what is your what's the cocktail napkin pitch for your company? How did you come up with the idea, and and where sort of are you now? Sure. So I went to UMaine for bioengineering uh, undergrad. I believe I graduated in two thousand seventeen. The dates are a little blurry. It's been <laughs> been a while, and I went for my master's for in biomedical engineering and finished in two thousand nineteen. I was one of those people for most of my life who struggled with eczema. I had tried every single product there was, every treatment from steroids to lifestyle changes. Um, Nothing worked for me. And when my partner and I were in grad school, we were working with these lobster scientists who were studying a protein that's responsible for the lobster's ability to pop off and regenerate their own claws. And there was literature to, uh, and evidence in literature to show that the same way that this protein helps them regenerate claws, it might help repair the skin barrier. So at that point, I was so desperate to try anything that we took this protein that they were looking at in the lab and formulated it into a cream and tried it on my skin. And in about two days, I started seeing my skin clear more than it ever has with any other product. And after about two weeks, my eczema flares were just completely gone. This was so incredible and life-changing that we decided that we had to dedicate our careers to sharing this with other people. So after we finished grad school, we moved down to South Portland and started Marin. And where are you now? How many employees? Sort of where are you in the the pipeline of getting a, a startup company going? We launched in January of 2020 at the start of COVID and faced every hurdle that you could hurdle in starting or facing starting up a business. We ran it out of our home for the first year and a half. And last summer, we got a 3,000 square foot warehouse and office space that we now run the business out of. And it's still just the two of us. But in the next month or two, we're going to be hiring our first marketing social media employee. So we're going to be growing the team soon. But for now, it's just the two of us. <laughs> Exciting times. Mm-hmm, very. That's great. Ty, you're not even graduated yet. and You, you have a, a going concern here. Tell us about your idea. Sure. So Real Time Reality was founded with the mission to create a way that we can know who is real on the internet. Today, we see that like two thirds of the internet, two thirds of all accounts, particularly on social media, are bots, people trying to impersonate others, and it really creates an unhealthy environment. And when you think that, you know, these Russian bot farms or corporations that are are trying to create these leagues of fake people uh, can have an influence on our perception of the world, of each other, uh, and create entire trending topics and, and really lead discussion. Um, that's pretty scary. So the way that we're combating this problem is by essentially creating really authenticated you know, biometric scans of people uh, and using that as a security and privacy measure. So we obfuscate your data from other services uh, and make sure that you are in control of your presence online. And then for the new exciting you know, Web3 metaverse 3D internet, uh, which my generation, you know, 87% of us play video games weekly. Uh, you know, that's already Web3, and it's a very exciting place to be. But, you know, we can actually stream you into these environments as yourself, an authenticated real human being with your facial expression, uh, how you move, so that these experiences in 3D environments can really become more face-to-face, more social, more human, and, yeah, just be kind of a recreation of the real world that all people have assurance is, uh, is you know, happening here and now. To show you the demographic I'm in, I didn't know about Web 2, let alone Web 3, so (laughs) good to hear things are progressing. So when you say biometric information, is that uh, fingerprints, eye scans? What what, what are we talking? So it's actually just uh, photos. So we have a a mobile app that can be downloaded, and you just take a bunch of photos, um, and we use that to create this really uh, safe biometric key from which you can, you know, manage your privacy and information online. And you're going to graduate and dive right into this? Yeah, so you know it, we're coming up on our one-year anniversary soon of uh, being a company, and yeah, that's the the full intention. We've got you know plans B, C, D, E, and F, uh, but you know we applied for the Rue Founders Residency, um, got MTI grants and, and funding, and uh, are really taking advantage of the you know burgeoning innovation economy here in Maine um, and all of the programs that Renee and, and the folks at the Foster Center have been kind enough to to share and tell me about and all of these opportunities. We're getting some Innovate for Maine uh, intern this summer. 
Yeah, it's exciting times. It's exciting yeah. times as well. That's great. Now we're sitting in this beautiful building here on campus up near Hilltop, if any, any listeners are familiar with campus. Renee, the Foster Innovation Center. Tell us, what is it? What is its mission? The Foster Innovation Center was created um, about 13 years ago with the mission of building a culture in the state of Maine that is innovative and entrepreneurial. Prior to that, my work involves helping to take the research and development that happens at the University of Maine and turn that into economic opportunity for the state. So new companies or new products for existing companies. And we are starting to see some of that activity pick up as the state invested more in the university's research and development capacity and and in other places um, throughout the state, the creation of the Maine Technology Institute. But what we were lacking was the bankers, the attorneys, the potential investors, the mentors, the experienced entrepreneurs who'd grown high growth businesses. We didn't have those people in the state, at least they weren't visible. I think there was only one intellectual property attorney in the whole state at that time. So we said, you know, if we're going to grow this, we need a culture. It takes a village to grow a startup, an innovation-driven startup. So we need not just the people who are going to start the companies, but the people who are going to support those companies in their growth. And so we said we have, you know, 12,000 students, close to 12,000 students at the University of Maine. And a certain percentage of them graduates every year and ends up in Maine. If we could start to build a skill set in those students and, and a mindset that this is something that I can do and I can get involved in and I'm excited about it, then we can start to seed that culture in the state. And um, soon thereafter, we um, worked with an alumnus, Doug Hall, to develop an innovation curriculum here at the university that's really the foundation of um, that skill development work that we do. And it's also the foundation of a bunch of the programs that we do. And so we're, we're building these innovation mindsets um, in our students and now our, also our faculty and staff. And we've done workshops and trainings for business leaders throughout Maine. We've trained more than 1,000 business and government leaders over the past year. We've been training K through 12 educators in innovation practices. So. Our mission has been to build this innovation culture that will allow startups, allow the research and development that's happening at the university to to grow and create opportunities in Maine. It doesn't happen overnight. It does not. <laughs> culture change takes time. <laughs> now, Amber and Ty, I want to ask you how you've accessed and leveraged the Foster Center here in a minute. But before we get to that, I, just a basic question for you, Renee. What is innovation, and can you teach someone to be innovative and creative, or are you born able to play the violin and it's just something you can do kind of thing? We, we completely believe that everyone has the capacity to be innovative, a proactive um, problem solver, and that's really what we teach in our innovation courses is the systematic approach to innovation. And, you know, a lot of people think they're creative, but then they don't know how to execute on their ideas. So that doesn't get you innovation. Um, And other people feel like they don't have a creative bone in their body, but they can get things done. We try to bridge that gap with a set of skills for each of them and a a repeatable methodology, if you will, to to innovate. So we completely agree that, that anyone can innovate within their sphere of influence or what they care about. But not play the violin. Maybe not play the violin. (laughs) Now, Amber, for you, how did the Foster Innovation Center help you get your company off the ground? What did they do for you? Oh, my gosh. A better question is probably what haven't they done. Um, We So I started my entrepreneurial journey when um, I participated in the student symposium. There was, um, for our senior capstone project, we were presenting at the student symposium, and we met Renee and ended up winning the innovation award. And that was a really incredible experience for us because for our senior capstone, we kind of had the idea that there was potential to commercialize it, but had no idea if it was really possible and if it was, what, where do you even start? So with that, we won some mentoring and got introduced to the Foster Center. And by um, being introduced to them and to the curriculum as a whole, it kind of helped us get that first startup off the ground. So we participated in mentoring and eventually I took some of the grad student classes and 
further learned that way. I participated in the MURDA program for my graduate project. We've leaned on them for so many, in so many different ways over the years. Ty, how about you? What did this place do to help you get your idea off the ground? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I kind of have a, a pretty similar journey. Um, you know, back when I was in high school in, in 2019, I was actually, you know, became friends with Justin Hafner and Patrick Reading and, uh, you know, saw this, this cohort move through the Foster Center um, and, and share their stories about, about how things were, were working out. And I, at the time, had been working on science fair projects and was dead set in becoming an entrepreneur. It took me a couple years to find that right idea. And when I did, I enrolled in the Innovation 121 course and applied here, uh, I think, on the same day. And then, you know, coming here, you don't know what you don't know until you know what you don't know. Um, and I'd say that that's, you know, one of the, the really big in intangibles um, that they, they taught me, you know, learning that process. The innovation engineering portion of things, you know, we have this concept that uh, any great design, you know, the Dyson vacuum, the iPhone, all of these things, how a Lamborghini looks beautiful, it, it, you know, you need that mastermind architect. And the innovation engineering course taught me that, you know, there's ways that you can structure idea generation in a group. You know, you don't need to do that as a, a sole entity. So, you know, from that course and, and learning practices for how I can foster an innovative culture within my business to the ability to be here into the wee hours working on code and have, you know, whiteboard space and a conference room to hold meetings. You know, these are huge, huge things that I couldn't be able to do alone, um, you know, in a tiny apartment. And, uh, you know, put, connecting me with resources, mentors, telling me that, you know, I'm on the right track, being able to go up to them and bounce a pitch against them when they've heard hundreds and hundreds of pitches and heard me pitch them hundreds of times right. uh, and, and tell me that I'm, you know, getting closer to the mark or straying further away is, uh, you know, I w wouldn't be able to do any of this without them. Now, we've heard that this term a couple of times as we've talked here, innovation engineering. So, Renee, what, what is that? How did it start? Uh, just give us the... Give us the lowdown on that. Yeah. So that's the curriculum that we developed when we opened the center here that teaches uh, a systematic approach to innovation. And it's offered as an undergraduate minor um, for uh, UMaine students and as a graduate certificate as well. And it really does teach this innovation mindset, how to approach problems and how to approach testing your solutions as well as a sort of a whole toolkit um, to, to use to help you in that process. It was developed when uh, Doug Hall, who's uh, graduated in a class of 81 and, and after graduating from UMaine went to work for Procter & Gamble initially and worked in there, even though he was an engineering graduate, worked in their product marketing department, which was sort of in the Procter & Gamble um, company, they were like the product managers. When they had a new product idea, those people managed it through the process. And he learned a lot through that process such that he went out on his own and started helping other Fortune 100 companies innovate and develop new products. Every, Pepsi, American Express, you know, names that you would recognize in your household. He's written books and been on TV. And so because of all that, he had been invited to be the convocation speaker here on campus right around the same time we were planning this building. And so uh, we reached out to him and said, hey, we're, you're this innovation expert and we're creating this innovation center. Um, what would you do? And, and actually at the time we were creating the innovation center, we thought we were going to do an entrepreneurship curriculum. And he said, I wouldn't do that. Why, why, why wouldn't we teach entrepreneurship? And he said, only a small percentage of people are like Ty, who know from the get-go that they want to be an entrepreneur. Most people don't, but everybody needs to be able to innovate. And that just rang a bell. Of course, everybody needs to be able to solve problems. Everybody needs to be able to communicate their solutions effectively. Everybody needs to implement ideas. So we started working with him on developing this curriculum and 
We've had thousands of students um, at the University of Maine. We, we actually have shared the curriculum with other universities around the US. And we also have trained business leaders, um, both through our efforts and through um, Doug's business. So around the world now, there have been something on the order of about 40,000 people who've been trained in this innovation curriculum developed here at UMaine. And the common misconception is that it's about the, that word, engineering, right? But you can be an art, art major, a philosophy major? Yeah, so the reason it's called innovation engineering is that it's very systems oriented. So we're teaching our students not only an innovation mindset, but a systems thinking mindset. So when you can see like how pieces fit together, you can solve problems more effectively and you can see where there are opportunities for improvement. And so it's not only seeing systems and using those to um, identify opportunities for improvement, but innovation engineering itself is a system. It's a whole um, collection of approaches and resources to, to create innovations, whether those are new products and services or just innovations for improving our communities or improving your own work habits. I mean, it really can be used at any any kind of level, um, it's really about a uh, proactive problem-solving approach. Now, Amber and Ty, you both are, what's the term, sought-after commodities because you're young people. Maine wants to keep young people starting companies, that whole thing that every state wants, wants to have. So can you talk about growing and progressing with your businesses here? Do you feel like with the Foster Center, as a base, but then just around the state, do you have everything you need to grow this business where you want to go with it into the near future here? Amber, let's start with you. I think we definitely do. Similar to the Foster Center, there's a very great entrepreneurial community down here in Southern Maine. And I think just that innovative approach to problem solving and systems thinking in general is something that a lot of people in the community share. And for us spe specifically bringing in talent, I, I don't think that we'll have a hard time finding other people who have a similar mindset and can help us grow and innovate and, yeah, just grow here in Maine. <laughs> Ty, are you going to keep this concern in Maine and stay in Maine for now anyway? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love Maine. It's a great place to be, the way life should be, as they uh, <laughs> say. Did on you the... come up with that? <laughs> <laughs> No, not an innovation of mine, I can say. But uh, yeah, you know, the, the ecosystem has really burgeoned over the, you know, the last 20 years. Um, and I think that's really what's made it possible to, to stay here. It's a great place to be, not, because, not just because of the resources, but because of the fact that, uh, you know, it, it's new. We are still a, a tight-knit community, you know. You can call up some of the other CEOs around Maine and all of the other entrepreneurs and, and get advice. Uh, and we all want to share it with each other. I've, you know, talked to, to students in my class and in classes around campus about, you know, how they can become entrepreneurs here uh, and, and leverage the resources that they have. And, you know, have similarly others have, have done that for me. So I think it's just a systemic thing that we need to keep going. And, I would encourage everyone to stay here because while there might be more money in, in California or other places like that, you know, it's highly competitive. You, you can't find a, a, a waitress in, in L.A. that doesn't have like, you know, some lines or a script, you know, or, or some short films that right. they want to show you. So in that way, the, the diversity of different industries here and the fact that they're uh, we have a smaller population, so there's not going to be, you know, there's blue shifts. We have Kinotech, you know, there's a couple of software companies, one aerospace company. So we each, you know, live in our own, in our own area and have the opportunity to, to excel in our separate fields. One thing I do tell students who are coming through the, the center with startups is in Maine, you can be a big fish in a relatively smaller pond. Um, and while that small pond in some ways might have some disadvantages, you're probably going to be more successful finding funding in Maine, even though there's less money total, than you are going to, let's say, Silicon Valley, where, as Ty said, there's one of you on every doorstep, and, and everybody's competing for that funding. So one of the things that we try to do at the Foster Center is help 
the students get exposure to other other people and, and make connections. And we also have some unique resources in the state, like, for instance, um, a really, really important one is the Maine Technology Institute, which was created by the state of Maine um, around the same time that the state started investing in R&D at the university. And it funds companies that are developing new products to bring them to market, innovations um, to bring to market. And most students in other parts of the country don't have access to a pool of funds like that. I mean, they might have to win a business plan competition to get some seed funding or something like that. Most of our students, with some coaching and, and, and pulling the right pieces together, can successfully obtain those funds and have $20,000 to get their business idea off the ground and, and go after more over time. And then we still have the pitch competitions and, and other things that um, students can participate in. Ty just won $5,000 Tuesday night in a pitch competition. So, nice. yeah. One question I want to ask, uh, people may assume that the Foster Center is just for students, but you've worked with uh, nonprofits, government agencies, Department of Education, uh, faculty, staff. Can people from the public come? I mean, who, who can access what you have here at the Foster Center? Our niche is really trying to help those entrepreneurs and companies that have true innovations that they want to bring to market, something that's not available anywhere else. So yes, we welcome any entrepreneur from, from the state to reach out to us if they have an idea. Not only will we help connect them to resources and provide some coaching, but We'll look for opportunities to connect them with other resources on campus, whether it's faculty and staff who have expertise that might be able to help them, or resources like our Advanced Manufacturing Center that might help an entrepreneur prototype their um, innovation. And and then we, the Foster Center has become the hub of research commercialization definitely for UMaine, but also we're supporting other institutions around the state, that research institutions around the state that have innovations that they're trying to commercialize. So we have a whole set of programs. Amber mentioned um, the MRDA Accelerator. She participated in that as a grad student with her faculty member. And we were, um, through that program, which is a really intense four-month process of figuring out, okay, we, we have an innovation. Is there actually a true market opportunity for that innovation? And if so, what's the best way to get there? And, and we put the team through a pretty rigorous process um, to have a clear plan at the end of that four months. Um, and we're, we just started our fifth cohort of that program. Amber was in the first cohort of that program, so she was she was one of the groundbreakers for that. Just from that, we've had seven new startups emerge from university research. We've had other um, collaborations with private sector partners around the state um, to bring those other innovations to market. So um, we're really excited about that. And we just, we keep adding on as we see opportunities to build upon what we've already done, where there are gaps as the teams are trying to develop their startups and commercialize their technologies. So as we begin to wrap up here, we always like to sort of ask, uh, what, what, do you, what do you see in the future? What, what's the crystal ball show to you? So maybe, Amber, let's start with you. If you look out five years, what's sort of a realistic... Uh, best hope for future for Marin Skin Care? Where, where do you think it's going to go? Well, we are hoping to grow the company still here in Maine. Um, of course, we're going to grow the team. We're working on that vision right now, the specifics and um, putting together our hiring plan. But we are considering bringing skin care manufacturing to Maine. That's a resource that we don't have here. That's a, a pretty big goal of ours. And developing new products and really changing the way that eczema is managed. Wow. Big goals. Yeah. <laughs> Ty, how about you? What, what do you see in five years, uh, realistic best case scenario? You know, hopefully we'll be <laughs> going up, <laughs> not down. Um, but I think, yeah, in the next five years, you know, we're looking to launch our beta this summer. So the product will be out there and, and uh, well developed. Hopefully we'll have a lot of people that use it on a daily basis. Hopefully we see that this has a positive effect, not just on uh, you know, people's ability to manage their own security and privacy, which they can't now, 
Um, but hopefully it also has a positive psychological effect because you know, part of this mission for real people and having real interactions face to face and the ability to do that uh, with the assurance of who's real is the idea that you know, if we're not stuck in a, a system where we're sorted by likes and comments and, and follows and all of this other kind of stuff, um, that you know, some of the, the depression that comes along with uh, my generation and the issues with body image and feeling like you know, you're constantly being compared to these celebrities and super popular people and all of this, um, that that really starts to dissipate as people put value back on just being themselves um, and interacting with other human beings. I hope you are usually successful because we definitely need that for sure. Renee, we'll give you the last word now. We, we just uh, learned this spring that uh, UMaine was named an R1 university, so the highest level of research activity. I imagine you're well versed in what that means. But to take us out in terms of what the Foster Center is going to be or the startup entrepreneurship culture in Maine, what, what do you see happening? I definitely see, you know, as the research enterprise, if you will, of the university grows, that just creates more opportunity for innovations to be uh, commercialized. So we're really excited about the growth of that activity at the university. And we will grow our innovation and commercialization support in concert with that. I mentioned we've done five cohorts of the murder program. We've been doing one per year. I could see in five years we have enough activity between what we're doing and, and the way we're supporting other research institutions that we're running that year round and, and spinning off more businesses and, and engaging more students um, in that activity. In, within the state of Maine, I think you know, we, are, we are on the cusp of really starting to see that, that culture change. And I really want to see, especially in the rural parts of the state, young people feeling empowered that they, they can create something, whether it's their own company or they, they know they can go to work for a main company. There are real opportunities here to innovate and, and make a difference, not just in Maine, but beyond. Well, exciting times, and we wish you all success, and uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing your stories with us. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this, our final episode of Season 6 of The Main Question. We'll be taking some time away as summer gets going, but work begins soon on Season 7, and we've already got some great story ideas to dig up that we can't wait to share. In the meantime, you can find all of our episodes on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, UMaine's Facebook and YouTube pages, as well as Amazon and Audible. Questions? Comments? Send them along to mainquestion at maine.edu. Thanks for checking us out. We'll catch you next time on The Main Question.